Okay, welcome to Ungrading, Why Rating Students Undermines Learning and What to Do Instead, our CIDL book chat for, for today. I will be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Hirsch. I'm the Teaching and Learning Coordinator in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. Um, I've been at CIDL for five years now. It's actually five years uh, yesterday, I think, was my anniversary of starting work um, in CIDL back when it was faculty development and instructional design. But I also earned my master's and my PhD at NIU, so I've been here for a while, and I've been teaching college English for 16 years. Um, I'll take questions throughout and at the end of the presentation, so if you have any specific questions related to what I'm talking about, feel free to post those to the chat thread. I'll address them as they come up. So now I wanna to get to know everyone here. I have some information about you from the registration, but you may not know each other. So in the chat, um, tell us what your department or division is, what's your role, um, and what you hope to get out of this workshop. I will mute myself just um, while you all are, are typing that in the chat. We, I get some um, spirited geese outside my window sometimes, so just in case. Okay, great, Melissa. I'm glad that you're able to join on your phone as well for the audio. All right, so it looks like um, most of you are just looking for some new ideas for um, about grading um, and how to get students to focus more on learning and less on grades, which uh, they definitely discuss in this book. So we'll get into what that looks like according to the authors of the book. Um, and we've got, a, there's a foreword by Alfie Cohn, um, who is a progressive um, pedagogy expert. Um, and so some of the chapters in the book as well, those authors cite Alfie Cohn too. But um, in his foreword to the book, Alfie Cohn talks about how grades themselves are the problem, not grade inflation. Um, so there's a lot of hand wringing, he says, over, over grade inflation, but really the grades themselves are the problem, not the grade inflation. Um, he also says that ranking students or curving grades is actually counterproductive for learning. And other authors get into more detail with that as well and their experiences with that. Um, and then he talks about descriptive labels. So sometimes if we, um, a faculty member wants to get away from you know, A, B, C, D grades, maybe they'll do descriptive labels instead, like needs improvement, proficient. But he says that those are just grades by another name and students will see them as such. Um, he also talks about narrative reports. So giving a student a narrative report about you know, your feedback or whatever on their assignment, their assessment, and he calls those monologues, not dialogues or conversations. So they don't have the same impact as a dialogue or conversation would have, in other words. Um, he draws this distinction between feedback, which is saying to the student, here's what I've noticed, uh, versus judgment. Here's what I like or dislike about what you've done. And sometimes we might muddy the two. Um, so feedback is helpful. Uh, to Alfie Cohn, you know, here's just what I've noticed about it, about your work. Um, and then judgment is less helpful. Um, so passing judgment on student work, telling them what you'd like or dislike. 
he uh, defines ungrading as eliminating the control-based function of grades. So, for example, students would propose course grades for themselves, and that's a strategy that a lot of the authors in the book take, and they take different um, approaches to that strategy, but we'll talk about the different ways that that can look in, um, according to the authors of the book chapters. Um, classroom ungrading, he says, is a stopgap measure to minimize damaging effects of a final grade. Um, so in other words, you know, just not grading in the classroom is not the ultimate goal. Um, it minimizes the damaging effects of the final grade, but if you still are required to have a final grade, um, then, you know, the work is, in Alfie Cohen's mind, not done. And his ultimate goal would be to wipe out grades altogether. Sometimes that is not necessarily um, possible. And so we do have this kind of more piecemeal approach of specific instructors, teachers, faculty members who are implementing classroom ungrading, so ungrading in their own classes. Um, and then different approaches to how to submit a final grade if that is required by your institution. Um, <laughs> He points out that preoccupa preoccupation with performance is detrimental to learning. And he includes peer and self-evaluation in that, which is interesting because a lot of the other chapters talk about integrating peer and self-evaluation as part of ungrading. Um, but he argues that in addition to just getting rid of grades, we really need to, or the act of getting rid of grades might lead us to have to rethink our curriculum, what we're teaching, um, rethink our pedagogy, how we're teaching it, rethink our assessment methods. So how are we assessing what we're teaching um, and then contending with issues of control. Um, so part of ungrading is giving up that control and giving it over to students. Um, so for example, the example that he gives is a detailed syllabus schedule where we've laid out every single thing the students are going to do for the entire semester and given that to them, you know, on the, the first day of class with their syllabus. And so we've already told them what we're expecting of them. There's no opportunity for individualization or allowing students to kind of explore um, things or give that giving them autonomy within the class or, or a say in what they do in the class. Um, one quote that um, I thought was really great to sum up what he's talking about is um, he says, when high school or university teachers protest that it's unrealistic to get rid of grades because students wouldn't do the reading or even show up without them, these teachers are on one level offering evidence about the harm grades have already done to these kids. On another level though, they may be unwittingly raising questions about their own teaching. If my curriculum and pedagogy aren't sufficiently engaging, is that an argument to rely on grades to coerce students into doing what I want? Or should I gulp and ask some serious questions about the quality of my curriculum and pedagogy? Even if it's true that grades might induce students to do more quote unquote work, that doesn't mean that they will have learned more. Um, he also talks about re some research findings about the inverse relationship between um, students who have a learning orientation versus a grade orientation, and that undergrad and grad GPA is not really predictive of post-grad outcomes either. Um, the preface and introduction were written by Susan Bloom. Um, she wrote the preface on May 4th, 2020, so we're just at the time in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, really in that first semester uh, of teaching with it. And she talks about in that preface, the brief preface, the, the COVID-19's effects on course policies, grading policies, and ultimately what grades mean at all. Um, and so obviously these chapters were written before the pandemic when they were just going into, uh, going to press with the book as the pandemic was, you know, raging and, and affecting education in um, great ways. So she also talks in this preface about the wide ranging effects of grades um, and why they might be difficult to get rid of, but not impossible. So some things that she mentions, mentions are athletic eligibility, scholarships, international student visas are sometimes tied to their grades, internships, financial aid transfers, et cetera. Um, and she ends kind of on a, a note about 
uh, quote, many enduring levels of inequ inequity are becoming apparent in this particular moment. So she's trying to um, have a kind of a Kairos moment there of this is really um, apropos to what we were experiencing at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and then her introduction was titled, Why Ungrade? Why Grade? And she notes that grading is an invented practice and we can uninvent it, she argues. Uh, she reasons for doing away with grades vary among the authors in the book. So some of them might uh, want to have their students focus on learning versus accumulation of points. They might want to be more responsive to students. They might be rebelling against audit culture, et cetera. And we'll get into what each of their chapters talks about in just a minute. Um, she says there are whole classrooms and programs, some public trying to create student and learning centered grade free educational settings, emphasizing mastery rather than arbitrary deadlines and measures, learning rather than compliance. Um, she gives an example. There's a lot of examples, actually. There's institutions, institutions of higher ed, K-12 institutions who've done away with grades. Um, she gives the, uh, a great example, though, of medical schools uh, moving to pass-fail and um, away from grades to create more cooperative communities. So they're not com um, competing with one another. They're able to be more cooperative. Um, and feel more comfortable cooperating with each other and helping each other out. And then also to lower high rates of suicide in medical programs because suicide rates are high in those programs because they're very stressful. Um, she also talks about some of the kind of buzz word issues that are going around like grade inflation, which Alfie Cohn mentions, um, grade compression, so some people complain, some faculty complain about grade inflation, um, some complain about grade compression, um, some institutions have, or departments have fixed grade distributions. So that's where we might get grading on a curve, for example. Um, and then she talks about all of that versus going gradeless. And um, her argument for going gradeless is that conviction that our principal task is educating all students, not ranking our students. So, you know, this idea that, you know, grade compression is a problem or fixed grade distribution is an answer to grade inflation or grade compression is that, you know, we need to be educating all students, not trying to rank our students the, you know, best and the worst, for example, they should all be receiving an education. Um, she also discusses the origins of grades from China's civil service examination, which has been around for over 1300 years, and then into the European context of oral exams, moving to written exams, which were pass fail and allowed, you know, as many retakes as you wanted in order to pass. Um, and then over to the US where we had uh, numerical and alphabetical grade systems from the late 18th century. Um, and then the letter grade system that we know of, which was A, B, C, D, E, F, um, began at Mount Holyoke College in 1897. Um, and how since there's been uh, this kind of tension between progressive or learning focused and scientific or sorting focused approaches to, to grading. Um, she points out the inconsistent meaning of grades. So grade makeup is different for different classes or even the same class taught by a different instructor. What counts? How much it counts? Participation, attendance, grading on a curve, final mastery, effort. Um, and she says, quote, it is common for grades to be inconsistent, subjective, random, arbitrary. Um, and then she brings up this idea of grading learners with different baselines. So how are you grading learners who start off in, at different places or different baselines? You know, do you grade based on initial level of mastery versus growth. So if you're you're grading based on an initial level of mastery, then people who have you know a higher level of mastery at the beginning of the semester will always have a better grade regardless of where they end up or how much growth they make throughout the semester versus students who might start at a lower level of mastery but grow a lot um, and catch up to their peers. And so how do you account for that in your classes um, with grading? 
There's three parts to this book. Part one is foundations and models. And we've got a few different chapters in here, but I want to pose a discussion question first, um, which I just want you to think about and post, you can post this in the chat. What are some challenges that you've struggled with in grading and providing feedback to students? And I've left this intentionally broad. So what are some challenges that you've struggled with in grading and providing feedback to students? We've got some great and familiar um, challenges here. Um, they aren't interested in feedback, just want to know that they have the grade. This tells me that they're not focusing on demonstrating their learning, but the grade. Um, significant differences in student performance or knowledge level. Um, teaching students in their final semester, so norms are well established and it's hard to be different, definitely. Um, that can be a challenge implementing something different to what they're um, used to. Uh, it can be difficult with beginning language students to come up with an overall assessment instrument. Exams really don't present them with an evil, even playing field. Um, having to decide whether to and how many points to assign or deduct when student ideas fall outside the parameters of the rubric. And rubrics are addressed in some of these chapters too. Um, I noticed that they become defensive on feedback instead of learning what the feedback is addressing. And uh, struggles, they, they mostly care about their grades and not how to better study or what the mistakes imply, how to improve moving forward. Great, so those are all issues that the um, chapters in the book, that the faculty address in those chapters. Um, so we'll get into the, the chapters of the first section. So again, this first section is foundations and models. And we've got five chapters. Um, the first one is how to ungrade, uh, you know, apropos, um, great first chapter explaining that. But um, so the, Stommel talks about um, his ideas of how to ungrade. Um, he talks about how a quote unquote objective grading approach became standard uh, in order to scale grading. So when we got more students, you know, it was easier to have more of a subjective grading approach to the oral exams and, and things like that in the, you know, 18th, early 18th, 16th, 17th centuries. Um, but once more and more students started going to college, then we needed a quote unquote objective, although it's not really objective grading approach. Um, so this involved ranking students, sorting them into rows and classrooms and where, warehouse-like buildings. So essentially the industrialization of education. Um, 
Stommel also rails against learning management system grade books and the what he sees as the fetishization of grade systems in these LMS grade books. Um, the discussions around LMS grade books are often about how they're automated and how efficient they are. Um, even mentions the um, appeal of, of the, the um, um, oh my gosh, I'm not remembering the name of it in Canvas, the speed grader in Canvas. Um, and he talks about this as sort of a transactional nature of grades. So it's a, a capitalist currency. Um, some of the negative aspects of grades that he points out are that it's not a good incentive. It emphasizes product over process. Um, it's not good feedback. It's not a good marker of learning. It encourages competitiveness over collaboration, and it doesn't reflect the subjective nature of learning. So I think partially behind this is um, that grading and the way that we grade. Sometimes we're focusing on trying to make it seem objective to students so that they don't argue with us. But even, the, even if it looks objective, all grading is subjective is what he, he points out. Um, his approach to ungrading involves self-assessment and metacognition. He has his students write process letters three times throughout the term, and he responds to them, and then students grade themselves at the end of the term. He includes some um, a list of questions to ask as well um, to get, kind of get us to think more about our process of grading or just grading in general and its value. So some of the questions that he includes are, why do we grade? How does it feel to be graded? What do we want grading to do or not do in our classes for students or teachers? What do letter grades mean? Do they have intrinsic meaning or is their value purely extrinsic? Does assessment mean something different when it is formative rather than summative? How does feedback function in relation to grades? Does grading create a power structure that frustrates authentic dialogue? And to what extent should teachers be readers of student work as opposed to evaluators? What would happen if we didn't grade? How would institutions be forced to rethink their hierarchies and systems for evaluation? If grades are going to remain ubiquitous in education, can we be more creative in how we approach them? Um, so the second chapter, what going gradeless taught me about doing the actual work by Aaron Blackwelder. Um, he talks about the idea of a teacher versus a gatekeeper and how a lot of grades make us gatekeepers rather than teachers. Um, he says that grades don't tell the student what was done and what could be done to improve. Um, sometimes we think it does as the, the faculty member, sometimes we think it does that, but it actually doesn't. It doesn't translate to the student. Um, he also thinks of grades as a shortcut to avoid the quote, actual work of teaching, which he sees as getting to know students, working with them when they struggle, finding creative ways to inspire learning. Um, he points out that learning is an ongoing process of trial and error versus judgment of who the student is, um, and that's what they see grades as. So uh, often students internalize grades as a judgment of themselves rather than just feedback on their work. Students, um, he says, also need to find value in what they learn. Uh, and so he, the, the way that he approaches this is through problem-based learning. Um, for example, in his class, he'll um, have a mock trial for Odysseus. Um, or he has another problem-based learning project where students need to work together to answer the question, what problems need to be resolved in our school? So that localizes the problem. It forces them to get out. Um, interview people, you know, do the, the hands-on research um, in that way, and then come up with solutions. Um, he also emphasizes individualized learning and giving students voice and choice in their learning. The third chapter is just one change, just kidding, ungrading and its necessary accompaniments. And this is by Susan D. Bloom, who wrote the, the foreword and the introduction. Um, she points out that grading requires uniformity. So there's a uniform input, uniform process, uniform output. And grades 
are a form of extrinsic motivation, according to Bloom, but she also thinks of them as threats. Um, she also points out that learning happens all of the time in the absence of grades. So, you know, if we listen, we're listening to a podcast um, it, on our commute because it's something we find interesting. We're learning. We're not getting graded on it. We're learning just for the joy of learning. Um, or watching a documentary or, or what have you. Uh, she brings up the Minimax principle, which is if the goal is the extrinsic, extrinsic reward, so in this case, the grade, then it's sensible to do as little as possible to procure the highest reward. Um, so the highest reward be that grade, the highest grade that you want. So some of those things that this can lead to, this principle can lead to if this is how we're running our classes um, and what affects grading has on students. It can lead to cheating, it can lead to, to taking shortcuts, it can lead to trying to cram for an exam, for example. Um, she also points out that grades are arbitrary. All grades are arbitrary. Um, one quote that I wanted to share with you um, that I think really kind of hits the nail on the head is she says, quote, a final problem is that grades encourage a fear of risk taking. Grades seem so consequential that students believe they can't take a chance on anything unproven. In most college classes, a mistake is punished by a lower grade, which is then averaged into the other grades, even if the student completely masters it after that initial try. Yet mistakes are information and contribute to learning. Um, so this idea that, you know, you get a grade, if you make a mistake, you pu you're punished by getting a lower grade, that lower grade affects your course grade because it's going to be averaged into your whole grade, right? So, you know, you don't want to make a mistake because that's going to punish you. It's going to give you a lower grade on the assignment and then overall in the course, and you can't really come back from that very easily. Um, she also emphasizes discussing goals with students rather than points breakdown and assessing the entire experience, for example, using portfolio um, assessment. She has students develop an individual plan. So they articulate a value of the class for themselves. They meet then with her one-on-one -on -one to discuss that plan. They also practice self-assessment. So they develop honest standards and self-scrutiny. And then at the end of the semester, they have portfolio conferences with her where they meet with her for five minutes. At the end of the semester, they prepare with a document to look back over their semester's work, so the portfolio of the work. Um, and then they propose a grade for themselves and they have a discussion about that grade. So um, she notes that it, one of the most difficult parts of ungrading is relinquishing that control, following students' needs and trusting students. She also um, includes some prompts. She has an appendice to her chapter and includes some prompts. So if you're interested in, in that, um, we do have uh, the ebook version of Ungrading through our library. So if you look for the title of the book in our library, you can download the ebook version um, and read that on uh, the Adobe Immersive Reader. So if you want to take a look at any of the appendices, the prompts, the example assignments that they, they include, um, you can do that um, through our library. Uh, chapter four is shifting the grading mindset. And this is by Star Saxstein. This emphasizes the importance of the language that we use. So grading versus assessing learning. Um, Saxstein advocates for using the word assessment rather than grading um, because a grade implies or the question that that students will answer if they're graded is what did I get what grade did I get um, versus the question we want to, them to answer right what did I learn and so for assessing student learning um, and giving them feedback or uh, and strategies, then they're going to be focusing on the learning part, not the grading part. Um, the quote that I pulled from her is a short one. It says, Com compliance can't be what motivates learning. She notes that low grades are discouraging, while high grades signal completion. 
maybe the end of learning. So when they see a low grade, they might be discouraged by that. If they get a high grade, they might think, well, I learned it. So that's the end. Um, there's some sort of completion there. Um, in her class, the, the students uh, keep a feedback log. So they collect feedback and strategies from their teacher. Um, they set goals for themselves. Then the teacher can target feedback and celebrate achievements based on those goals that the students have written for themselves and their reflections on the feedback that they've received. Um, she also advocates for targeting your feedback. So I know I've been guilty of this in the past where I'm just commenting on every little thing when I'm marking up papers. Um, but when students look at that, you know, if you think about that from the student perspective, I'm going to see all these markings. Oh my gosh, this is intimidating. It might, I might feel like it's an attack on me. I might feel like it's a criticism of me. Um, and so I might feel overwhelmed, like oh, there's just too much for me to fix in this. Um, and so I might just give up. So by targeting feedback, we're not commenting on trying to comment on too much or on everything. We focus our feedback. Okay, what's the most important thing? that the student needs to do to grow, to learn, to improve. Let's focus on that, let's get them there, and then we can touch on something else the next time around. Um, and then towards the end, she says, we would be remiss if we just kept doing the same thing because it is how we have always done it. All right, the final chapter in this first part is, um, stifle or grade stifled student learning can we learn to teach without grades um, and this author says that grades take the focus off of feedback and this is something that you know your comments on your challenges with grading um, support so grades are taking the focus off of the feedback they inhibit growth um, he advocates for written and verbal feedback about what students did well what they can improve um, and he uses an online portfolio platform for student work and documenting their progress toward their learning goals. I think he said he uses Seesaw. So you can use, you know, a portfolio platform or just, you know, have folders for different students in um, the learning management system and have them kind of collect all of their work and their feedback there um, and write about their goals so that you can kind of take a look at their work as a whole at the end of the semester. Um, but I, th I think a couple of a couple of the faculty members in these chapters, and I can't remember whether um, Caravalli was one of them, uh, talks about this idea of grades and feedback um, and the effect on student growth in the class. And there was a, one experiment that was done with three different either groups of students or three different classes, where with one group, they gave them just the grade on their assignments. Um, with another group, they gave them a grade and feedback. And then with a the third group, they gave them just feedback. And the just feedback group surpassed the other two groups with pro their progress. Um, and the other two groups were about even. Some of the people in the uh, grading and feedback group actually did a little bit worse than the grading only group, uh, but not st statistically significant, I don't think. Um, but it, you know, when students see a grade, they disregard the feedback, which I think we can all think of um, examples of that in our own grading. Um, so the best way, um, according to these authors, or you know, this author, to take. Um, or to mitigate that is to not give them a grade. Um, so some key takeaways from these chapters were about the transactional nature of grades as sort of a capitalist kind of currency, um, the fact that grades aren't incentive feedback, markers of learning, promoters of collaboration or objective, that grades as a uh, might be an, a shortcut to avoid the actual work of teaching, depending on what you see as that, that work um, for that author. Um, it did not promote what they saw as the actual work of teaching. Grades are arbitrary. Students do need to see the value in their learning in order to be invested in their learning. Um, learning happens in the absence of grades all the time. 
and the presence of grades removes focus from actual feedback. The second part of the book is on practices. So another question, um, some of the, the practices involve peer and self-evaluation. So have you used peer and self-evaluation in the classroom and to what end? So go ahead and, and post that to the chat. Even if you haven't, you can just say, no, I've never done it. Um, but have you used peer and self-evaluation in the classroom? And if so, to what end? Okay, great. So some no's, um, some peer evaluation to make sure they're contributing to groups work, um, using peer evaluation in a variety of ways, most often on short written assignments or in class presentations, uh, midterm and final self-evaluations in a clinical setting, peer evaluations with in-class presentations, uh, peer evaluation to provide feedback on drafts of papers, um, peer evaluation, working in pairs for peer review with guided questions that you provide to help them structure feedback they provide to each other. Great. So all normal ways of using peer feedback um, and some, some use of self-assessment as well. So we've got five chapters in this section. Um, the first is chapter six, Let's Talk About Grading by Laura Gibbs. And her process is, she calls all feedback, no grades. And it's just what it sounds like. No grades on student work, but a lot of feedback. Um, she cultivates a culture of feedback in her classes. She teaches students about giving and receiving feedback to make good use of it. Um, she has students write self uh, declarations in the grade book. So through the LMS, there's a, she'll put up an assignment where they just declare that they've done or not done the assignment. Um, and they just, they get credit for, for doing the assignment through those declarations uh, in the LMS. And students get ABC letter grades based on their declaration points total from the grade book. Um, and they're just pass, not pass. You either pass if you declare that you've done it or you don't pass um, if you do not submit it. So what she does is she'll keep an eye on those numbers and reach out to students with the lowest totals in the grade book with encouraging emails. Um, one quote that I uh, wrote down for her was the main function of grading is coercion. And she sees grading as um, inherently punitive. So it punishes students for making mistakes rather than using mistakes for feedback or learning. Um, revision, um, she advocates for revision, but when revision is tied to a grading system, she says, um, quote, at best students see revision as a way to raise their grade. At worst, revision becomes a form of punishment inflicted on students for a poor grade. You did a bad job, so you have to revise. Um, and then she goes on to say that with no grades though, revision is what you just need to do to learn and improve. Um, some of the benefits that she touts for on grading include reducing stress both on her and on her students. Um, it helps her help her students form learning habits, makes room for creative work. So things that maybe not, you know, we brought up rubrics may not really fit tidily into a rubric. Um, so, you know, it gives that room for that creative work. It promotes better communication. And it also raises new possibilities for course design in her mind. Um, chapter seven is on contract writing and peer review. 
um, Katapidis and Davidson talk about uh, their policy about pedagogy of equality. Um, so their pedagogy is to support the greatest possible student success, creativity, individuality, and achievement. Uh, so regarding contract grading, they explain why to their students, why they're doing contract grading. Um, students then contract for a grade in the class. They contract for an A, B, or C grade. The contract spells out the requirements and the penalties for fulfilling or not filling, fulfilling the terms of the contract. Um, they get satisfactory or unsatisfactory grades on work, and those grades are given by their peers. Um, so students are our peer graders once per semester and they give feedback to two of their peers. Um, the grade contracts are spelled out clearly and she actually has an example um, in, in her chapter. So you can go and look at what the grade contract looks like um, in her chapter if you are interested in that. Um, D and F grades are there, but you obviously don't contract for a D or an F grade. What she says is those grades do a breakdown of the contract relationship. Um, and what they see um, contract grading as doing is um, giving students the authority and the creativity to potentially propose their own contracts as well. So she gives them you know, a contract or they give them, sorry, there's two authors. <laughs> they give them contracts um, language, but they do offer that flexibility for their students, either collectively or individually, to propose their own contracts. Um, so one example that they give was um, one of the faculty members who wrote this chapter um, was had to be absent for one of the classes at the beginning of the semester. And so the students still met, and they got together, and they decided, hey, we want to propose a uh, new collective contract for the class that we all want to get an A and this is what we're going to do to get an A and it was actually to publish a book together so they had you know different students who are going to write different chapters together and you know through all, all the steps of the process and they actually did end up publishing this book. Um, so it gives kind of that flexibility to, or you, you need to develop that relationship with your students that they know that they have that flexibility where, you know, if they want to propose their own contract, either collectively or individually, they can do that as well. Um, the next part of their chapter talks about collective peer feedback. Um, and within that part, they talk about how they co-create the syllabus with their students. Um, there's components of self-evaluation and peer evaluation. They put them into static groups throughout the sem semester, and the function of these groups is like a team. And for their final grade, the student recommends a final self grade based on their self and peer evaluations. So they grade themselves, they, and they also grade their group members um, based on a worksheet that they're given out. So they have to provide detailed qualitative assessments according to this form or this template that's provided by their teacher. Um, and one of the benefits that they mention for this process is that it gives them a more dem democratic and connected classroom. All right, chapter eight is uh, Critique Driven Learning and Assessment by Christopher Reisbeck. Or Reisbeck. Um, and his process is do, review, redo. And that's what they do throughout the entire semester. So um, he talks about implementing this in his programming class, an upper level programming class. And he tried it out in other classes as well. And he talks about that towards the end of the chapter um, about maybe some of the failures in other classes and why it might have worked in this class, but not others. Um, but this was an upper, as I mentioned, an upper level level pro programming class and students um, selected an exercise and they would send their professor a working solution. The professor would critique it and then return it to them. And then the student would revise or redo it um, and then return, you know, turn it in again. And then they would repeat this process until that 
exercise had no more critiques. The professor had no more critiques on the exercise. Then the student would choose a new exercise and then repeat the process, rinse and repeat until the end of the course. Um, and there was a, um, you know, a, a way to, <clears throat> the term grade was based on progress, um, quality and effort. The details were outlined, expectations for effort were out, explained to students and, and are also briefly explained, explained in the chapter and the way that he explains it is, you know, the different exercises have different levels of difficulty and, um, you know, effort required. And, you know, so they would need to show that they're progressing and putting forth effort and moving into um, more complicated exercises um, by the end of the semester. Um, and then, what he did to make the, the critique process faster for himself was he would create a library of brief crit critiques to reuse electronically. Um, and he now, I think he said at this point that he wrote the chapter, he was up to 500, you know, of those that brief critiques in his library. Um, and he also actually created an online critiquing application called Code Critic. Um, he he explicitly talks about rubrics as well um, uh, versus critique and says that critique is more efficient for him in his experience. Um, analytic rubrics, he says, don't really um, give students specific enough information to be able to um, redo the exercise. And then single point rubrics end up taking, they might work better, but they end up taking more time to implement than doing the critique in the way that he does them. Um, so that was one of the, the, the things that he explains and, and talks about with rubrics there. Um, and you can go and, and take a look at that too and look at more about what he has to say about, you know, how rubrics might not be sufficient um, for feedback. Uh, chal <clears throat> excuse me, challenges. He outlines are that he doesn't have any standardized due dates be because students pick an exercise and the exercise the exercise can be from you know a list of exercises and some of them might take more time than others and so there's no standard due date standardized due dates um, so he does occasionally um, doesn't happen with many students he said but um, has students who might you know not might see that lack of a due date as a lack of um, uh, prioritization for his class and for those assignments if they've got, you know, looming due dates in other classes, for example, and those students who wait until the end of the semester to start turning in and turning anything in will fail because they haven't done that um, do um, review, redo process the way that they need to. Um, he also talks about one of the challenges being, you know, something that we all deal with as well, plagiarism of code um, and, you know, how he has to kind of police that. Um, but, you know, there are platforms, particularly for coding, that you can search for open access code there and it's fairly easy to copy and paste, he says. So it, it's not a huge issue for him right now. Um, but the other challenge that he mentions was when he talks about try, talked about trying to implement this in other classes um, and critique driven learning, he said, only works if the students want to master the skills that are involved so that they have to see the value for the effort. And he's tried in other types of classes to demonstrate that value in different ways but the students don't really see it as an immediate value the way that, okay, if I learn how to, if I learn how to do this, this code, um, I can see the immediate value in that right away. Whereas, you know, with things like professionalization and team um, coding and things like that, it, the, while um, employers may want to, want to see that or see that as lacking, students may, even if you tell them that, students may not see the immediate value for the effort that they are putting forth. Um, all right, chapter nine, so there's two more chapters in this. Uh, chapter nine is a STEM ungrading case study, a reflection on first time implementation in organic chemistry too. And um, 
she in this chapter she outlines on the integrating plan for a course obviously organic to uh, including self grading based on feedback compared to the instructor grade so she does grade in this course but she with, withholds the grade she doesn't give them the grade so she gives them the, her the, her feedback then the student based on that feedback determines what they think their grade should be and then the um they submit that and they talk about that and uh the score their ultimate score on the exam is determined by taking the professor's score which they've withheld and not shown to the student um, and then the uh, student self score and averaging um or averaging those out and then looking at the professor score versus that average score and then choosing the higher of the two as the student's exam score. Um, she also describes an extra credit or grade deduction policy. So the way that she tries to mitigate potentially students inflating their grades is um, that she has an extra credit or a grade deduction policy that's based on the number of standard deviations between the student, student self score and the professor score. So if they're very close to the professor score, then they get some extra credit points. Um, if there's you know, more than a few standard deviations away from the professor score, then they get actually a grade deduction off of whichever is the higher grade. Um, so the process is they take the exam, they get their feedback, they conduct their self-assessment, and then there's a conversation with the faculty member. Um, a couple of the challenges that she mentions with her method is that there is a learning curve to it, uh, both for her and for her students, and it is a very time-consuming process, she says. All right, the final chapter in this second section is the pointless classroom or a pointless classroom, um, a math teacher's ironic choice in not calculating grades. And Gary Chu talks about how, or points out that teachers are afraid to take risks, for example, taking the risk of taking on ungrading. But ironically, we ask students to take risks in our classes all the time, but we're afraid to take the risks too. Um, so he points out the irony in that. Um, so he describes his process as, so he went, he moved from, you know, grading everything to only summative grading. So only grading the summative assessments and then moved to uh, standard based grading or SBG. And then finally to metacognition and descriptive feedback. Um, he also talks about how he gives the option for alternative assessments to demonstrate learning for students. So if they want to you know, propose an alternative assessment, they can. And like the other, you know, faculty authors in this book, um, they he works with students to co-determine their end of semester grade. Students make the case for their grade, for example, through written reflection or vlogs, podcasts, in-person conferences, and a conversation between the two leads to an understanding and ultimately they agree on a, a course grade for the student. So some key takeaways from this section are feedback, feedback, and more feedback or critique as the one author um, calls it. Student participation in assigning semester grades. So um, there's different strategies for how to do that. Um, some components of that can be, you know, self-grading, peer grading, instructor grading, combination um, of multiples of those um, revision or redo to improve and learn instead of as a punishment or being tied to a grade. Um, and, you know, it's very difficult to do revision to improve or learn if it is tied to a grade. Um, pedagogy of equality versus sorting, excluding, and competing, and then peer collaboration and co-creation as democratizing the classroom. All right, so part three is reflections, and this part's a lot briefer. Um, I do have a question, but we're running short on time, so I will just kind of leave you with this and you don't have to put it in the chat, but what do, challenges do you think you would face implementing an ungrading strategy in your courses, and do you think certain courses would be more challenging than others to ungrade, and why? Um, so the reflections are really just that. These chapters are reflections. Um, the first chapter, Grade Anarchy in the Philosophy Classroom by Schultz Bergen, um, he talks about his 300-level philosophy of law course, 
Um, he gave them a buffet of learning opportunities, only required assignments, um, worth three reflection essays. And then, you know, they had options with the other in that buffet um, of learning opportunities. And then they'd have a couple of one-on-one -on -one learning conferences midterm and end, end of semester where the student would tell the professor their course grade. Um, and then they, you know, would collaborate on learning outcomes to establish intrinsic motivation, um, motivation. And then their second class was a pitch for grade anarchy with students critically evaluating the hypothesis and argument that was presented by in writing by the professor. Um, he also details the successes and failures of implementation, explanations of changes that he would make for next time. Um, you know, as expected, some students went above and beyond, some didn't. Um, so you can kind of take a look through his chapter if you want to take a look at, you know, what his approach was, as well as what changes he would make um, were he to do it again. Um, and really at the end, he says, sure, there are some students who probably would have done more work, understood simply as completing more assignments in a graded classroom, but it's not obvious to me that they would have learned more. So maybe they would have done more, but he's not convinced that they would have learned more. Um, chapter 12, conference musings and the G word. Um, this is chapter is just a series of lightly edited blog posts from a seventh grade teacher's real-time experience implementing ungrading in an ELA class. Um, it also includes a letter that she has sent home to parents explaining the new um, ungrading process in detail and also provided a copy at the end of, of the end of term conference worksheet she had for students. Um, chapter 13 is Wiley Coyote, the hero of ungrading. Um, and in this one, he says, perfection in teaching is the roadrunner. We are never going to catch it. We need not be as pathetic as Wiley Coyote and his failures, but we must vow to be as dogged in pursuit of our mission. Um, and really, the um, really this one is about how reading and responding to student work and ungrading, he argues, is more pleasurable than grading, um, which he sees as picking out and quote unquote remedying their defects. Um, and ultimately, he's arguing for teaching consistent with your values, and uh, mentions that. He himself uh, realized that he could not teach consistent with his values because he was teaching as contingent faculty, uh, I think he had said for 17 years, which wasn't aligned with his values. So at the end of this, um, he's not going to be doing ungrading again because now he does um, pedagogical trainings instead of, um, instead of teaching, which he quit. Um, and then the conclusion basically talks about how um, only went to a different page. Um, outlines challenges, areas for further research, advocates for connecting K-12 and higher ed educators, specifically those that are interested in or doing a grading to learn from each other and to collaborate. Um, so you can take a look at that conclusion if you're interested in some of the things that she outlines for, you know, what we could do to do further research, for experimentation, for growth, to take those risks. So here are the key takeaways before we, we end here. Um, reading to provide feedback can be more enjoyable than reading to grade. Um, I think I've, I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, some structure or scaffolding may be necessary if you implement on grading. Um, on grading may work better in certain contexts for certain courses or for certain groups of students. Ungrading also needs a lot of explanation and communication. We also want to teach in a way that's consistent with our teaching or pedagogical values. And again, there's a lot of opportunity for further research, experimentation, and growth. So we can take those risks. Um, oops. So if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat. I'll stick around for a few minutes. Um, otherwise, I thank you so much for joining me today to talk about um, this book, Ungrading and the many ways that that could look in different classes and different disciplines. And I hope you have a great summer. Um, and I'm going to stop the